So uh, yes, my dear friend Jen Warfield is in Smith Warfield is in the house, and uh, she is a wordsmith extraordinaire, word sculptress, I should say. We've known each other for a very long time, uh, particularly through our uh, study with Barbara Marks Hubbard, the, the visionary. So Janet, without any further ado, I know we're starting just a, a minute behind schedule, which I think is pretty darn good. <laughs> I'm going to give hosting uh, privileges to you. Okay, good. This is the art I'm going to talk about. I don't usually do didactic teaching, but this morning I'm going to do it simply because there is so much material to cover and I can only really cover the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, didactic teaching does that faster than interactive apply. However, if you have questions as I go along, I would suggest you raise your hand or maybe we can take them at the end if we have time. So this is all about, ooh, well, I got to work my way through the logistics here. Ah, reconnecting. Yes. Can you see the change of screen? Yes, you may want to put it in slideshow though, so we can see the whole screen. But yes, we um, see. That's where Up I top can. there. Is is that? Can you see the whole screen now? Uh, yeah, that's better. That's better. That's better. Okay, we do the. I, I do the best with the logistics that I can. I think um, it's good to go. All right, good. So this is about reconnecting with your own soul, your one precious life, your family, your community, and our planet. And that is what this art of word energy alchemy is about. It is a vehicle or a tool for reconnection. So what in the heck is world energy alchemy? We humans have created thousands, probably millions of words since the beginning of time. And we keep creating more and more every day. I mean, I created this term word energy alchemy. And most of us spew our words out without stopping to think about their emotional and energetic impact on our own souls, our own unique, precious lives, our families, our communities, and our planet. So word energy alchemy offers us tools. These are vehicles or tools, using words as vehicles for returning to and continuously being in and functioning from a state of present moment awareness. Of course, you can use your present moment awareness to plan for the future if you want, but it is a conscious choice of where you're going to focus and how you're going to use your words. So at Word Energy Alchemy, is also the art of consciously and intentionally choosing our words, where sometimes we choose silence in each moment to create, co-create and manifest a peaceful, powerful, prosperous planet together and forever. So, <laughs> How do we think about word energy alchemy or how do we put this stuff together? So if you think of your words as pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, say a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, and it's spread out all over the place in chaos. How do we put this together to create a complete, all-inclusive, coherent, beautiful and meaningful picture. Let's begin with who you are, and then we move out from there. 
are you simply going to parrot the words? And I think Noel put this in the chat before that you were taught by your parents, priests and teachers without understanding their deeper experiential meaning. Now you know that great art is not created by cloning. So you will never discover who you are by simply imitating someone else, including me. Yet, you can learn from other people. You can learn from your parents, your priests, your teachers. You can observe what they do and don't do and how well it works. You can notice the impact their words and actions have on your own body, mind, and spirit. So word energy alchemy, it's really, it's an art. It's a learned skill of putting words together, just as you would put the pieces of a puzzle together, which would also be a learned skill, consciously and intentionally to create, to create and manifest a beautiful, clear, complete, stable, but also dynamic and creative answer to the question, who am I? And it's also an art and learn school skill of putting words together to create, co-create, and manifest with others a peaceful, powerful, prosperous planet. So this is where I'm going to focus my words today, consciously and intentionally. And I can't begin to cover everything as I say, this is kind of the tip of the iceberg. But words as placeholders and simplifiers for complex experiences. Why we humans created words, what words do, how words work, what we humans do with words. And then shifting into a little bit of a different dynamic here. Um, the, the whole concept of concepts, these are words that have been made up. They're not original with me. Power over power under power against and power with. We see so much of that dynamic going on in our world all the time. And it can either be verbally, for example, if I say, you're stupid. Ooh, how does that feel? It doesn't feel good. But if I say, oh my gosh, what, what you're doing is just beautiful. These are the power the energetic impact that our words can have both on ourselves and others, helpful forms of language, and finally, wisdom practices. So beginning with words as placeholders and simplifiers, I'm gonna go down a little bit into these, each of these rabbit holes, but I'm not very far <laughs> because we only have half an hour here. So human created words, are not the experience of what has been called the word or the eternal Tao or nirvana or eternity. Those words are placeholders for an energy, um, and I'm throwing out words here, an energy or beingness that the mind can neither conceptualize nor understand. Buddhists say words are fingers pointing at the moon, but they are not the experience of watching a glorious full moon rise. Totally different standing and reading about a full moon and actually being in that experience. So why do we create words? probably to communicate with one another in a new way, not just runs and snorts and hand gestures, but meaningful, agreed upon sounds that appear to point to something out there, uh, which is a, a separation in itself, a disconnection. But we do this to understand, to alleviate pain, perhaps to give meaning to our lives, to create, co-create. And manifest, and that's the really important thing without harming ourselves, others, 
or our planet, There's a, a, as well as we're able to do that. So what words do? Words separate, divide, and categorize for the most part. Uh, love, hate, high, low, like dark, good, evil, right, wrong, black, white, oriental, indigenous, Jew, Christian, Hindu, Islamist, Taoist. And there's an occasional exception like the word whoosh, which kind of emulates the sound of rushing water. But for the most part, words separate, divide, and categorize. And I have here on the right side of the screen an optical illusion done by a friend of mine, John Langdon. Nothing in the image changes, but what how does your mind shape what you see in that image? Do you see the word hate or do you see the word love? And how does that impact the way you feel? So what words do? They keep separating our minds, which created these words, keep separating, dividing, and categorizing all these words into smaller and smaller parts. So we keep creating and co-creating tinier and tinier bricks in the great wall of knowledge. And this is the uh, photo of the great wall of China. And look at all the graffiti over there, all the words that have been written. What was in people's minds when they did that? I don't know. But words can also be used to focus our attention, build connections, and that's how what my focus is this morning. How do we build these connections and reconnections instead of the separations and the divisions, allowing us to communicate and open our minds to new possibilities. And this is a school in a little village in Uganda, Katwadi. Uh, it's a primary school run by a friend of mine, John Santamu, although you can't see it in the photo right now. He was actually showing the community how to use Sawyer water filters to provide clean water for that community. So what words do, so continuing on this thread, if understood literally, words separate us from one another and from the environment that surrounds us. But if understood alchemically and energetically, they can become useful guideposts or tools or vehicles, if used consciously and intentionally, for reconnecting us, energizing us, and transforming us into the powerful creators, co-creators, and manifestors of truth, beauty, freedom, and love we were intended to be. And the photo here is, I believe it's the West Portal of Chartres Cathedral, which is beautiful. And somewhat, there are some analogies, if you look for them, if you're looking for similarities between that and the logo behind me, the image in the logo. So let's use a metaphor here. Think of Albert Einstein's formula, E equals MC squared. Words are on the right side of that equation. The words soul or emptiness or non-dual consciousness or God or Allah or Jehovah or awareness or the eternal Tao or be here now or the still point are all words. They're fingers pointing toward the left side of that equation. The, I use the words living, breathing, energy, um, it has no boundaries. It can't be really correctly described in words, although there are lots of words that have been used to try to express it, as you can see here. The words are all different, but the underlying connectivity is there for all of us to access. So we're conditioned. Again, what words do, we are conditioned from the time we are born into this human created world of words and concepts from the moment we are born. 
this is mommy, that is daddy, that's the dog, that's the cat. And these words are simple to understand. And most of us would agree on what each word means. However, if my mommy is different from your mom, and if my daddy is different from your daddy, we now have the same word pointing, the word mommy, daddy, pointing to two different people. And we need to notice and clarify that, which is probably why we created the words my and, and your <laughs> to differentiate the underlying referent. And sometimes we use the same words to structure different experiences. Uh, this is, and, and my words here don't completely uh, relate to the photo. This was, I believe, right after Hurricane Ernesto, but it was in Atlantic City, New Jersey. There were cold gray waves rolling in as breakers. And in this case, the beach was not grounded, but sometimes in Atlantic City it is with uh, sunbathers, bikinis, tan bodies, little children building sandcastles with their fathers, red, yellow, and blue umbrellas, seagulls squawking overhead, black scallop shells, boardwalk peppered with bikers and joggers, and casinos in the distance. But the water is cold, murky, and thick frequently most of the time, with stirred up sand and with a land breeze, nasty, biting black flies appear. John might verbalize this experience as a day at the beach, very general language. But Jane, who lives on Roatan, Honduras, might use those very same words, day at the beach, to verbalize a very different experience. So on Roatan, it is rare to see breakers. You can see how smooth the ocean is, wonderful for snorkeling. The sea is a clear, placid mirror of blues, greens, and turquoises. Seaweed gently washes up on the white sand, weathered driftwood and palm trees dot the deserted narrow stretch of sand bordering the sea. And an occasional boat accents the skyline. There are no sun tanners here for the tropical sun burns tender skin far too quickly. Instead of nasty biting black flies, Jane is tormented by sheetras, those dastardly invisible no see -ems that with a single bite can leave a welt the size of a tennis ball. So these are very different beach experiences, but until John and Jane put the word beach in context, they are using the same word beach to describe two very different experiences. So their speech is not as clear as it could be, and their communication becomes as murky as the waters of the Atlantic Ocean. If John had never experienced the Roatan Beach and Jane had never experienced the Atlantic City Beach, they might even argue about whether beach sand is gray or white and whether the ocean is gray or blue. So sometimes, we use different words to structure the same experience. And this is similar to that um, optical illusion that I showed you earlier, that love-hate optical illusion, except this is in um, Glastonbury, UK, um, at Little St. Michael's Retreat Center. So suppose John and Jane are walking through the same garden. John may be focusing on the paths and trellises, and Jane may be focusing on the roses and delphiniums. As a result, the words each of them speaks to describe the same garden walk will be different. And if you were to listen to John and Jane talk about the garden, you would be hearing very different words coming out of their mouths. 
If you had never visited the garden, you might believe that John and Jane were talking about different gardens, but they're both walking through the same garden. So this is how miscommunication and misunderstanding arise. And I'll get to this a little bit later, but this is where we ignorantly use our words sometimes in these power over power under dynamics, power against dynamics, or we, if we can, and word energy alchemy can help you do this, shift into a power with dynamic, which is not static, it's dynamic. But if you stop the motion for a minute, so you can look at it, it's the Christian symbol for prayer, this power with dynamic. And the Buddhist symbol for namaste, Buddhist and Hindu symbol for namaste. So a really wonderful set of words for me when I discovered these uh, written by Alfred Korzybski, the famous Polish semanticist. The map is not the territory. And I thought, oh, yeah, I get that. So I kind of elaborate on that. The words are not the experience. The menu is not the food you eat, as shown here in the photo. There's a difference between actually sipping that drink and reading the menu that tells you about the drink. Looking at a map of the west coast of Florida is not the same is driving north on I-75 and breathing in the beautiful bougainvillea, the swaying palms, basking in a spectacular sunset. So and now going into this power over power under dynamic, which is this, and it can be either verbal. And if the words grab people and take hold, it actually can also become physical abuse, uh, one person abusing or using another. So getting into the physical side of this, I also had to deal with this Atlantic City Council and unfortunately on the verbal side. The word on the street was, that he physically abused his wife so badly that she had to be hospitalized. And it's an example, of, an excellent example of ignorant, unconscious, uncontrolled eruption, explosion of power over because of his own deep feelings of inadequacy and inferiority. And you, you may be familiar with the bully coward archetype. And he'd never had the courage or the ability or the education to do the inner work, to examine and transform his own feelings of inadequacy and inferiority. The councilman violently beat his wife up so he could feel important and in control for one small moment in time. He could have killed her. So I think it's really important to be aware of the um, destructive impacts our words can have if they aren't used consciously and intentionally and through choice. So, but there are other forms of power over and power under, which are aware, conscious, and functional, and certainly intentional, uh, an example uh, was when I was three years old, my mother and I were walking along Roosevelt Boulevard in Northeast Philadelphia. And then suddenly, a three-year-old, I decided to go my own way and I jerked my hand out of hers and started to run across the multi-lane highway traffic, trafficked highway. My mother used power over really fast to grab me, yank me back to safety and spank me. And I was clearly in a power under position. 
but my mother knew much more than I about the lethal impact of cars on humans. She had no intention or she had no atten- intention of allowing the only child she would ever have to ignorantly kill herself. And she may have saved my life. So her intention, I spoke there in terms of no intention, but her intention was to save my life and keep me alive. So there's a difference here between a, Freud uses the terms uh, death wish and life focus. And here's another example of power over and power under, but this is aware, conscious, and functional. So if I'm on a plane that's having engine, engine trouble, I listen to the instructions of a pilot who has 40 years of piloting experience. I do what I am told because I want to live. But again, the focus you see is this pull toward life and living. So I know the pilot has many years of training and experience that I have never had. And now I'm just, uh, this is another hypothetical. What if the plane, for whatever reason, is being piloted by a five-year-old? It may be precisely one of the reasons it's having engine trouble. So who in the world ever gave that child permission to play the role of pilot? A child's ignorance, and it's more inexperience, but it's also lack of knowledge, but lack of experience will get us all killed if that child is given role power, that the child has not lived long enough to experience, understand, and master. So power against, uh, uh, again, this is a, a, a story from history, his story, not her story. Power against, and this is dysfunctional and life destructive. When used unconsciously, power against can have deadly consequences as we clearly saw in World War II and are seeing now today, again, a repetitive pattern in Ukraine. When the Japanese Navy bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, Their worldly patriarchal intention may have been to rule the world, but ultimately the effect was very different. And intentions and effect, that's a whole other (laughs) one hour seminar or more. So on August 6, 1945, Hiroshima, Japan was devastated by the first atomic bomb. Three days later on August 9th, 1945, Nagasaki was devastated by a second atomic bomb. Over 100,000 Japanese died, and six days later, the Japanese surrendered. So power against, again, dysfunctional and life destructive, and it's exactly what we're seeing in Ukraine today. And we're also seeing it in things like the the terrorist bombings in schools and the attacks on the capital of the United States. This is from history. Nazis came to power in Germany in January 1933. And this again is the rhetoric. They believed, and Hitler certainly taught, that Germans were, that's a separation, Germans, a particular race, heritage, nation, were racially superior. So their intention was to create a racially pure state through world domination. Is this what Vladimir Putin is intending to do today? And to physically kill those they considered inferior, Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, Germans with disabilities, and some of the Slavic peoples, particularly Poles, and I guess some of the Russians. And Other groups were persecuted. Again, this gets into the rhetoric, the use of words on political, ideological, and behavioral grounds. 
communists, socialists, and Jehovah's Witnesses. So on September 1st, what do we have there? Six and a half years, inflamed by the rhetoric of Adolf Hitler, Nazi armies invaded Poland. Boy, we've got a real similar pattern going on right now in Ukraine. On April 30th, 1945, after annihilating defeat, and this is how dysfunctional power over um, intentions ultimately end, Hitler took his own life in his bunker underneath the Reich, the Reich Chancellery. And two days later, on May 2nd, 1945, Berlin surrendered to the Allies. And five days later, German army commanders surrendered all forces to the Allies. But look at the destruction that we humans created. And it began with the rhetoric. So between 1939 and 1945, Six million, estimated six million Jewish men, women, and children were murdered by the Nazi regime, as well as millions of other Nazi, Nazi designated, here's the rhetoric, quote, inferior people. And during the entire Second World War, an estimated total of 70 to 85 million people perished, which is 3% of the 1940 population. So there are, it, it's interesting that these dynamics, as you look at the specific instances of them, um, integrating power against and power with. So it's, how can we integrate the power against and power with? And a lot depends on the intention. So again, when used consciously and intentionally to promote life, uh, life enhancing and life empowering purposes. We can do another whole hour just on the concept of intention, right? Intention is one of the Buddhist eightfold paths. So power against can become a vehicle for both self-improvement and other improvement. When two football teams compete against one another, if the competition is done with the intention of improving each team's own skills and performance. Again, we're getting to, into intention here. They play with an attitude of good sportsmanship. At the end of the game, they congratulate the winning opponent who has challenged them to improve their own skill and mastery. And we've got the same thing here when I was a child. Uh, we played softball in the summers with my father on the street in front of our Glenside, Pennsylvania home. And we were playing to be the best we could be. When someone hit a home run, everyone cheered. Both, both teams cheered. And it's also the way in my birth family, we played board games in the evenings. Or my mother would organize. My mother was an elementary school teacher. She would organize games among the neighborhood children in the summer. We'd go out and we'd play Red Rover or I See Something Red. And it was a wonderful coming together team experience. So there might be a game winner or loser, but it was only a game. And everyone who played was there to enhance his or her own ability. And everybody was part of an interactive team where everyone won because each player gave his or her all, increased their skill and experience, learned and grew. And that is what is possible on our planet if we set a right intention. So helpful forms of language. If your intention is to reconnect, if your intention is to abuse other people, you may as well just get off of this, <laughs> this presentation right now. Go Go find somebody else who wants to abuse and fight and go out and by yourselves in your own field and fight each other. Uh, get your AR-15s or whatever you want. See who can kill the other one first. However, if you think, well, maybe that's not really what I want because I'm the one who could get killed. If your intention instead 
is to reconnect. Let's start with this reconnecting with self, which is the first step. Know thyself. How do we use words to know ourselves? There aren't really right or wrong words, but they're words that are supportive or helpful or useful, or words that suddenly give us a new idea, a new perspective that fits in with and helps solve something we are struggling with or it supports the words that support us. Uh, you know, an example is generally a feeling of being loved supports us rather than a feeling of being hated and abused or used. So if we want to use and choose, use and choose our words to facilitate knowing ourselves and partnering and partnering in co-creating a peaceful, powerful, prosperous planet, what personal word wisdom practices generally work best? And I speak only from my own personal experience. I'm not telling you, you should use these, you ought to use these, but this is what has worked for me. Again, this is reconnecting with yourself. Use first person singular. Use your stories, stories from your own life, maybe some of your challenging stories where you've overcome something really difficult. Ask questions. Um, you, and, and there are different kinds of conversations. Again, that could be another whole seminar. But there are conversations with self, which absolutely must be uncensored. There are conversations with one other person. And then there are conversations with a large, among a larger group of people. So you're speaking from your own perspective. You're telling your own stories. You're asking the questions that you need to ask right now. And then it's not only asking questions, but it's asking the right questions to support this reconnection rather than a dissonance and a disconnection. You can use koans, that's what the Zen Buddhists use. That's a tool that they use a lot. I'll get into some examples of some of these. Metaphor and analogy, and I've already used some um, metaphors and analogies. So first person singular language, why do you use, again, if you wanna reconnect with yourself, why do you use first person singular? Well, it almost seems obvious because it focuses your mind on the way you perceive your world or perhaps want to perceive your world, not on what your mind and emotions are projecting outward. It keeps you out of generalizations. As you can see, there are exceptions to these generalizations. For example, a day at the beach. They're very different experiences for different people depending on where they are. So first person singular language supports you in owning your own experiences and the words you have chosen with which to manifest them. Keeps you out of self-righteousness. You're not telling anybody else what to do. You're simply doing the inner work of looking inside at your own it's really watching your own mind lots of times and watching what it does and watching your own emotions and what's going on in your own body. So it connects you with your own spiritual power and your own soul through which your one precious life manifests. Um, so it, it empowers you to know yourself. You know your strengths, you know your weaknesses, you know your resources. You know what you can and can't do. And then you're in choice in each and every moment through freedom and choice. First person singular language empowers you to be the very best human you can be without harming others. So what words can you use? And I could also phrase these as questions. I think right here, right now, I feel I need my choices in this situation are, I need to learn or I need to know. I can look for answers here. I can trust. And let me just real quickly rephrase these as questions. What do I think? What do I feel? What do I need? 
right here, right now. What are my choices? What do I need to know? And whom can I trust? Whom or what can I trust? So stories, why do we use stories? So you, when we tell a story from our own life, particularly one that has opened up our mind or shifted our life in some unexpected way, you are owning your own experience and the words you have chosen with which to share them. Again, stories keep you out of self-righteousness, which I think in Christianity is one of the worst sins, self-righteousness. You're simply sharing your own experience using words. So there are wonderful ways, stories are a wonderful way to communicate deep meaning without sounding authoritarian. And through stories, um, I just did a TV show on Monday for Planetary Peace, Power, and Prosperity, where I had a conversation with Ann Gordon, who does whale watching tours. She told some amazing stories, <laughs> basically getting hit over the head with a two by four is what it felt like. Uh, but so the stories with a twist, with an unexpected ending that opens up the mind and you, as you write these stories and as others hear your own stories, they're invariably drawn into archetypal patterns that humans have experienced over and over throughout history. So they contain deep life lessons and they help you discover new ways to solve old problems. Stories empower you to manifest your own unique perspective and soul, and it is unique for each of us. And interestingly, Jesus taught using stories for parables. And questions, and I've already flipped some of the language around to ask questions, and it may have a different impact on you, whether you phrase things as a statement or a question, but again, they open your mind in the minds of others. They offer you a deeper understanding of another person if you're asking the questions of another person and more clarity around whatever dynamic is going on between you and another person or you and a group or you and a culture, whatever it is. They put you in deep listening mode. And the Buddhists use the term beginner's mind. It's a mind of inquiry. And again, they keep you out of self-righteousness. Socrates used questions. But it's not just asking questions. It's asking the right questions to get the answers you need, but also to support this reconnection. And in this case, uh, it's reconnection with yourself, but also reconnection with everything else, your spouse, your children, your family, uh, your community, our planet. So before you can ask the right questions, you need first answer the question, what do I need? And nobody can answer that question except you. So if you ask, why doesn't my husband pick up his clothes? Well, you may get an answer, you may not. But it's a disempowering question. So all you succeed is doing, doing is increasing your own frustration, probably. <laughs> but if instead you ask, what can I do about the clothes on the floor? You've got lots of possible answers because that question is an empowering question. You can pick the clothes up yourself. You can ask your husband to pick them up. You can ask your kids to help pick them up. You can hire a housekeeper to come in and do it for you. Uh, but if you start complaining to your husband about the fact that he's not picking up his clothes, you will likely just create separation. You might get the clothes picked up, but what do you want your relationship with your husband to be? And I'm getting a message that my internet connection is unstable. Sorry, I have no control over that. So koans, it's a paradox. It's a verbal paradox. The underlying energetic connection is not separated, but it's a word paradox. The words look as if they're very different and very opposite. opposite. And it's used to train Zen Buddhist monks to abandon 
ultimate dependence on reason. And I've got the word force in there, but that's, it's probably to kind of hit them over the head with a two by four, with a conceptual two by four, into gaining sudden intuitive enlightenment. Some examples. If you practice sitting as Buddha, you must kill Buddha. Maybe it's you, should, you must kill the conceptual mind, the maps. What do you call the world? What is this? Out of nowhere, the mind comes forth. And just wash your bones. In other words, do something useful instead of sitting here and complaining. So metaphor. A metaphor is poetically saying something is something else. Example, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. That's William Shakespeare. And when you start thinking about that, it's probably true. What role are you playing on the stage of life? What role do you want to play? An analogy is a little different. It's saying that something is like something else to make an explanatory point. So it's more complex than a metaphor. For an example, what you're doing is as useful as rearranging deck chairs on a sinking Titanic. So wisdom practices. There are individual linguistic wisdom practices, and then there are group wisdom linguistic practices, and they're very different. The individual ones, and this is part of exploring who you are and reconnecting with your soul and your one precious life. You can write affirmations. Affirmations are positive first person statements. For example, I am strong, I am courageous, I, I can do this. I am beautiful, I am powerful, I am peaceful, I am respectful, whatever you want to write. You just, these are your own affirmations, so you can write anything you want, but they're first person positive statements. Notice whether your energy shifts after you do this. And also, if you write them, put them up where you can see them every day, because they're a reminder and a practice to stay in that positive beingness. Journaling is just exploring maybe a challenge you have. It's really an interesting practice. No censorship. Nobody has to see it except you. When you're done, you can burn it if you want. You can tear it up. You can shred it as Trump has done <laughs> uh, with a lot of his writings. But journaling, you're starting out usually with a challenge. And you just write. It's not straight line logical thinking. It kind of, your mind kind of just, you're, you're watching your mind and, and just um, noting what comes through. And it kind of goes around like this. But at the end, if you, I can almost guarantee you, you will come out in a new place with a new idea about how to move forward. Poetry, poetry is just fun, particularly haiku. Um, Haiku is a Jap Japanese art form that I've played with a lot. Uh, for example, a cardinal trills its welcoming reveille through stillness of mind. Uh, Sanskrit mantras, I have a whole pile of stories that I have told at various places. Uh, 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 Sanskrit mantras, um, there's one Om Shreem Kleem Lakshmi Namaha, which is calling abundance into your life. I kept repeating that over and over and over again. And it was just amazing. I don't know whether it was focusing my attention. I'd find pennies on the ground. People were treating me kindly instead of using me and abusing me. Uh, vision boards. And I have, I believe, an example here. This is one of my vision boards. I have done how many? One, two, three, four, five, six. I've done seven of these over the years, and they're different at, at each moment in time. And I have actually manifested every single thing on this vision board. 
once you create, and, and there, I don't have time here to go into it, but once you create a vision board, you put it up where you can see it every day, just like the affirmations. It changes your own energy field. I'm just going back to group wisdom, linguistic practices, circle work, mastermind groups. This is more than two people. You can also do dyads, practices, wisdom, linguistic practices with only two people. Uh, circle work, I'd refer you to Ron and Victoria Friedman, who are my mentors in that. Mastermind groups, I'm trying to think. I believe Mark Victor Hansen. Um, there are many people who teach mastermind groups. So, summary. Summary. Again, I'm just hit, hitting the tip of the iceberg here. This is actually really fun to play with once you get into it. Uh, but words are placeholders. They're simplifiers for complex experiences. And that's one thing I'm trying to do today is simple, give you an overview, tip of the iceberg, uh, why humans created words, what words do, how words work, what we humans do with words, power over, power under, power against, and power with helpful forms of language and wisdom practices. So you see all the words here, they all look separate. <laughs> they all look distinct and distinct and different, don't they? And we can go down any rabbit hole, of any one of those words in front of you, or you can just be here now and then use the word tools you've learned, you've learned to shift the dynamic that's going on around you if you choose. So uh, again, going back to the beginning, this is about reconnecting with your own soul, your one precious life and one precious physical life we're talking about here, your family. A lot of people I know have family challenges right now. Your larger community, whether it's your religious group, whether it's your uh, meditation practice, whether it is um, your genetic family, uh, you know, your, your community, your, your city, your state, your country, or our entire planet, which also includes the earth that supports our lives. So this is, this is on our website, Planetary Peace Power, andprosperity.org. It's our vision statement. And this kind of gives you a feel for the shifts that are possible by using word energy alchemy. It's away from not feeling good enough to stepping fully into your own unique personal power while not harming others or the planet that sustains us. Away from abusing others or allowing oneself to be used and abused toward self-compassion and other compassion. Out of fear and terror, I've been there, I know that feels like it's not fun into inner strength and courage. And that really demands a reconnection with a living, breathing energy, a power greater than yourself, whatever words you want to use. Out of rage, I've been there too, to making amends by changing your own conduct. And that is not always easy because usually um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, out of rage and into standing firmly in right action, but, um, and that changes depending on circumstances. Rage is not a fun place to be, I can tell you. Uh, shame or guilt, you make amends, you change your conduct, you start respecting other people and listening to other people as appropriate, or perhaps standing in your own strength and power, and away from a transactional transactional money economy of lack into an abundance economy of giving and receiving as you are able out of planetary war and desecration and into deep inner community and planetary peace. So according to my computer, we have four minutes left. 
if you're interested in exploring more deeply, uh, there the word energyalchemy.com site is not, we're not yet promoting it, but there's some interesting free information there. And I think some of it includes a, a piercing the veil of illusion play that Noel and Bob did with me. Uh, was it for World Unity Week last week, Noel? Or, or I think it was for one of your co-creators, Convergence. Yeah, I think um, so. Okay, I was telling you my internet connection is unstable again, bless its heart. Uh, and, and planetary peace, power, and prosperity, I will tell you we've been having some challenges, re logistical challenges recently with that site because we're using site ground and they just decided to migrate everything up to the cloud and they disappeared some of the things that were originally on that site. But there's still a lot of really valuable information there. Uh, if you're interested in going deeper, if you have the time to explore, there's a lot of really good content there. There are a lot of videos. Um, there's an explanation of our logo here, some a basic explanation of that, yeah. because we're conditioned to separate ourselves from this. I'm going to use the words living, breathing, energy, non-dual consciousness, whatever you want to use. Uh, we're conditioned out here. And then the first challenge is, is how to reconnect. And then once you have reconnected, then it's how are you going to use this one precious life you've been given? How are you going to manifest out into the world and give back to the world and to other people? So I'm going to stop there. We have about two minutes. I don't know whether anybody has any questions or comments. I think there was something in the chat, which uh, let me... Um, I'm going to stop my share. And um, yes, Janet, there have... were some wonderful things in the chat. And oh. uh, let me share some things with you. And um, all right. So it says this is a, a wonderful lecture. I believe if we could get folks to listen to it. <laughs> it would increase civility on this planet and lead to peace. So I think that's uh, quite real. And Patricia says, my philosophy is history is biography. Never so yes, stories. Learn from the past by listening to stories. Now, who doesn't want to sit around a campfire and swap stories? How, how long has that been going on, right? <laughs> Which is, is the group dynamic. That's like the circle work. Everyone's sitting around a campfire in a circle. Yes. And then uh, Tex had to leave, but he said, uh, much gratitude for your profoundly stirring presentation, Dr. Janet Smith Warfield. I need to leave. CCC will have the recording, which I'll be reviewing. <laughs> so... Um, Yes, and Patricia, you're welcome to unmute yourself and jump in here with your comment about etymology of words. Let me make sure you can do that. Uh, yes. Whoops, I just changed it. <laughs> <laughs> you can unmute yourself. There you go. Welcome. Okay, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Huh. Thank you, Janet. It was really, really very interesting. And the etymology of words is something I had mentioned. <clears throat> like reveal means remove the veil. So if you visualize what the word means when you remove the veil and you see, you use the word reveal with the, you know, a physical image of what the word means. <clears throat> Sorry. And there are a lot of words with the when you know the etymology, it takes you in one step further into an understanding of, of the word itself. Just a fast comment on that. Do you know the etymology of the words Catholic Church? The etymology of Catholic Church? Universal community. Universal. Catholic is all, whole, universal, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<clears throat> and uh, Kim, you're unmuted, and I know you're another wordsmith, so why don't you jump into the conversation here? Thanks for being here, Kim. And you're future. welcome, and thank you for joining me earlier in the week. Um, hello, everyone. Um, and, uh, you know, just we're on very similar missions, complementary missions, and I really appreciate it very much. Um, words definitely have energy. Words bring about the world that humanity creates. I mean, it it's all comes from a conception, right? Everything is a conception. Um, and then we, bur we birth things into being individually and collaboratively through our language, whether that's energetic word or whatever. Um, and I really appreciate um, the information you're bringing in current so that we have a chance to reflect and, and hopefully realize the empowerment that each of us has and likely the difference that we're making in greater ways than we have any idea. So, so thank you very much for all of this today. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Appreciate it those who joined me here. I, I, Patricia, I can identify. If only people would listen instead of talking all the time, we'd have yeah. an entire different world, but it is what it is and you do the best you can with what you've got. Yeah. Well, another word I wanted to point out is recognize, reconnectere, which means to re-know. So when you recognize something, it means you already knew it. And we need to realize that there's so much that we do know in our heart, but we don't allow it to express and you you made a good point on that very issue mm -hmm. if, if i can add to that that would be i put hyphens in words mm. so re and then hyphen cognize to re hyphen member um and this whole thing about listening if we can recognize or recognize that when we say i know and it's only up here we don't it doesn't happen very well and then when it's heart, it's a little bit more. And when it's what I call whole body knowing, then we bring that living essence into being. And I think that's what you were doing here today. So mm -hmm. That was my intention. It doesn't always work out that way for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, dear friends. Um, Janet, 10 seconds, final words. We need to move on to our next presentation. Well, trust yourself explore, play, and pay attention to the words that are coming out of your mouth and how they're impacting your own body and, and your own body, your own actions and your own emotions. And then use your own words consciously and intentionally to support others. And sometimes it's just keeping your mouth shut. <laughs> well, with that, I'll keep my mouth shut. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And um, we're coming up with our next guest with, uh, with uh, Fran Bailey and Kathy Mason. So stand by. You're more than welcome to stay. Hold on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>